David because I remember Billy Tate used to get up here and he would always announce a film evening. It wasn't a film evening, it was a film evening. And uh, we as kids growing up in this church, we used to look forward to that film evening for a whole month. And we would usually end up by going out to prams for tea on the Saturday night, milk the cows, and then excitedly come back to the film evening. It was a highlight of our lives. Good to see it happening again. Great. You kids, come on, it's a great film. We've been um, doing a bit of plugging on the internet and so on and emails to people in Oz about the um, reunion here in uh, Labour Weekend. I hope you're doing the same, going to your friends and saying, come to this reunion. And we came across a guy by the name of Daryl Martin. I don't know him, but I know the Melvilles know him, one. He was apparently here for a while and he, he sent his greetings to you folks. And he said, especially, I remember very fondly, my teacher, Joy Melville. And he said, she was the best teacher I ever had. So that was a nice compliment, wasn't it? So uh, we bring you greetings from these folk who are looking forward. He can't come, unfortunately, but uh, he would love to be here, but he sends you all his special greetings. I remember I'd been left school for just on... Uh, um, are we working on this, Lewis? Is that right? For just on um, three years, and I received a, a nice big envelope one day that arrived in the mail, and it had on big letters on the right hand corner, OHMS, and it was addressed to me. And I thought, wow, a letter from the Queen. You know, I, I knew enough in those days to know that OHMS meant on Her Majesty's service. And so I was very excited because I'd had this mail from the Queen addressed to me, Lynn Weber. I was so excited and I opened it and my excitement soon vanished because it was a call up for military service. It was in the days when they changed from compulsory to the ballot system. You may remember that. And they would put birthdays, numbers 1 to 30, in a uh, barrel. And they'd draw three numbers out for each month. And the 14th of December came out, my birthday. And I was in the army. And uh, I, I remember how, how devastated my poor mother was when I was called up in the army because she had a brother who I was named after, his name was Sam. That's actually my name is Samuel, Samuel Lynn. And uh, so Sam was a lovely boy, she told me. He was a wonderful young man. And he went into the army and when he came back, he was never the same. It absolutely ruined him. So you can imagine my poor mother, here was her son going into the army and he was going to come back ruined. The first thing we had to do, we went to the army, was down there and the building's still standing there. It's was, been used as a was an auction house. You know the one? I can't remember what street it's in, but it's down there. It's a corrugated iron shed, really. And we went in there, and we had to have a medical check. I remember going in there and standing at the desk, and they signed us in, and they checked our names and numbers. And then he said, well, go through next door in the other room there and strip off and have your medical check. So I, I went in there, and uh, I saw naked bodies all around, but I wasn't getting down to naked bodies. I got down to my undies and I said, that's enough. I mean, I was brought up a good Seventh-day Adventist and one never exposed their body as a good Seventh-day Adventist. And I remember going up to the doctor and he didn't even look at me. And he was sitting at his little, little desk there and uh, he just carried on writing and he said, what have we got here? He's keeping looking down. He said, soldier, you're in the army now. Get your jocks off. And he said it in such a way that I didn't question him. And then came back the report, and so I received my call. I was called into the, into the army. And that's what I want to talk about today, some of the experiences that came to me while I was in the, in the army and uh, how we can learn. I want to turn in our Bibles to Romans 8 and verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Now, this is either very slow, Lewis, or it's not working. Romans 8, 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Notice it says here, and we know, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You notice it says in particular the other part of the verse, I want to see the, the call. And the reason that you are here this morning is because God has called you. You've been called and God loves you. 
You know, it, it, um, it was a hard thing for me to come to grips with growing up as a person that I knew I loved God, but I found it hard to understand that God loved me. And, and I think it helped me to, uh, to appreciate that. Ah, oh, it's finally come through. <laughs> Praise the Lord, it's working. <laughs> it, it, it found it very hard for me to, to appreciate the fact that God loved me because when I, when I first met Susanna, you know how you, you fall in love with somebody and you're attracted to them. And you go along through life and that was fine and you know that you love them and everything's okay. But it suddenly dawned on me one day, and it was several years after we were married, that this woman actually loved me. That's what changed me. And, and friends, it is true, when you suddenly come to the realisation, you know that you love God, I know that I love God, but when you suddenly come to the full realisation that God loves me, God calls me, he loves me, it changes your whole outlook on life. I know that some of the younger people might be saying, as I said, if somebody told me this when I was young, oh yeah, I didn't come here because God called me, I came here because mum and dad made me come. And I had to come. I, I can remember when we were at the old Norfolk Street Church, sometimes we would watch when mum was sort of nodding off a little, we'd sneak outside and we'd run down the back and go down the back to the, to the river down the back there, you know, and walk in the mud. And we'd sneak in just before the benediction came, so we'd get away with it. We had many hidings going home after church when we were growing up as kids because of that. And I didn't see myself as being called to church. Some of you may say, I come to church because that's my habit. I go to church every week because that's my habit. Now, what is this stupid thing doing here? I'm having trouble with this. I, I lost my computer the other day and um, it crashed and I got a new hard drive, so I'm still trying to get it all set up again. It's a good habit to have to go to church regularly. But if it's just that, friends, that's not enough. The church is only a means to an end. The end is to be connected to God through Jesus Christ. That's why we are here and that's why we exist. The only right we have to exist as a church is to draw people to know God and to find Jesus. That's why we're here. And whilst it's a good habit, and it must be a habit, but it should be more than that. Some may say, I came here because somebody asked me to come. And we're glad you're here. Welcome to the Whangarei Church. It's nice that you're with us. But ultimately, it doesn't matter because you're here because God loves you and God calls you. Look, look at John, um, John 6 and verse 44. John 6 and verse 44. I think we're back on track again now with this computer. John 6 and verse 44. John 6 and the 44th verse. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last days. You notice it again? Unless the Father draws us, we cannot come to God. And the Father draws us through the working of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. The word, the word for the Holy Spirit is parakletos in Scripture. That means the, the helper. In Bible times, if I needed a counselor or needed some help with some issue, it might be a relationship crisis, I would seek what they called a parakletos and I'd ask him for help. If I was having trouble with my income tax files, I would go to the parakletos and he would help me sort it out. And so a parakletos was, was known as a helper, a guide, or a supporter. And that's the word that the Bible writers use for the Holy Spirit, the, the helper and supporter. And the Holy Spirit, it, it draws us. This is the, the nurturing aspect, I believe, that, that we see of God. And so the call, the call comes to each one of us because God loves us. Notice the passage started, one in Romans said, All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Now I could see no good in being in the army. I remember the, the, the lifestyle. I hated the lifestyle, the discipline. You couldn't think for yourself. You had to do everything that they said. They, they instructed you on every little aspect of your life. I hated the food. I, I remember eating the stew and uh, it, it, it tasted strange. I said to one of the soldiers, I said, what is this? 
And he said, it's steak and kidney pie. It's beautiful, isn't it? I said, yeah. I said, you like some more? I was so glad that we've taken a stand of not to eat offal. I hated the food. I hated the lifestyle. I hated the filthy language and the jokes that they use in the army. I mean, they were foul. Absolutely foul. I hated to being taught to kill. I remember as a, as a young boy, I was always very sensitive to seeing things die. I remember my Max. You remember Max? We went out and caught a goat at your place, Jim. I don't know if you remember that. Little, we got a little one. We just ran it down and finally caught it. And we brought it home and made a pet of it. Everything went well one day till mother came inside and found the goat sitting on her bed, of her bed, sleeping, with a whole lot of little raisins beside it. <laughs> mother was not very happy, so the goat had to go. And I remember, and I won't tell you how Max did it, but Max disposed of the goat. And I remember I saw nightmares for nights after that. Really chewed me off. And here I am being taught to kill people. I hate everything about the life. So now I believe that what Paul is saying when he says all things work together for good, Paul is not, not saying here, I don't believe, that God mapped it all out. And this is what's going to happen. Because if you say that, you have a problem with some of the things that have happened to people in this life. And I can't accept that God is like that. But what Paul, I believe, is saying is that all things that happen to me in life do work together for good in my life if I trust in him. That's what he's saying. Because this, I believe, what God wants us to do, he wants each one of us to reach our full potential that is within us. And the experiences that we go through help us to reach that potential in life. You know, um, I call the army experience in my life, I call it my Joseph experience in this way, that Joseph, he was a spoiled brat, wasn't he? I mean, I, I look into these, we have a, we have a, great, a great sort of a, a, a pedestal we put these Bible characters on. You know, these, these people, these holy people, they were no different to you and I. Exactly the same. And Jacob, he treated Joseph very unfairly for the other brothers. Joseph was a spoiled little brat. And, and uh, you know, to, for Jacob to give him that coat of many colours... And what it all meant, the second to youngest son, it's no wonder the brothers arced up. And then I identify with this just a little bit because whilst I, I won't go so far as to say that I was spoilt or a spoilt brat as a kid, but I think looking back I have to admit, and I'm using a euphemism here, that I probably was the favoured son on some occasions. And I know that my brothers used to get very upset over that. And I remember some of the anger that was expressed as I grew up as a child. And suddenly here I am, I find myself in the army, the favoured son, being treated like a rat bag and a scoundrel. Like Joseph, it made a man of me. And that's what I'm saying, those experiences that Joseph went through is what developed him and encourage him and enabled him to bring out the full potential that was in Joseph. And he became the Prime Minister. Look out, Helen Clark, I'm on my way. <laughs> but you can see what I mean. And I believe that's how God works in our lives. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. I remember one day I was standing on parade. It was a hot day. And several people, when I say several, three or four people had dropped and fainted because of the heat. Because when you're on parade ground, you stand for ages at attention. And the slightest movement, they'll... Poof. I remember I just moved, just to shift my weight a little, and moved back just a fraction. A sergeant came up to me and he stood beside me and he said, Soldier, until you move then... You were the only one in the whole army standing in the right place. For a moment, my heart just surged with pride. Wow. I was the only one in the whole army standing in the right place. And then the truth of what he said gradually seeped into my heart. 
and my pride turned to bitter disappointment and despondency. Because as you know, I was the only one standing in the wrong place. The army wants you all to be the same. The army wants uniformity. And people must look exactly the same. And, and one of the things that happens here, they want to strip you of all civilian life and all civilian rights when you go into the army. And the first thing they do is strip off all your clothes. They have a fetish about removing your clothes in the army. The first thing we did, took off all our clothes. And they gave us these old baggy gear that we had until we got our proper uniforms. Even down to baggy underpants. We had to put everything army on so we all looked the same. The army wants you all to be the same. They want you to live exactly the same life. Now, I've even got an old picture of myself in the army. There we are. I don't know if you know Neil Ellis. He's down in Christchurch. He was there with me at the same time. You notice everybody looks the same. We had the uniform. There was our tent that we slept in. And somebody, um, and I think it was for my benefit, put on there the saints. That's where the saints live. And uh, that was life in the army. They want you all the same. They want you to think and act the same. So this unity or uniformity, many people will use the text in um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 for a text for this, that we've all got to be the same. Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 1. Acts, the second chapter, and uh, the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And in the King James, it says they're all with one accord. I think the word is used there. And so it has often been taught that we as Christians should all be the same. We should all think the same. We should all have the same concept of views and so on. And we should all, That's not what the Greek is saying at all. The Greek there is saying that they were all in one place at the one time. It's talking about their geographic position, not their theological position. Never did they all think the same. You trace through the history of the early church leaders. They never all thought the same. But physically they were in the same place. And the Bible does not seek for uniformity. The Bible seeks for unity in faith. Unity. And because God has made us all so different, even the fact of the cell division, how the chromosomes line up on the genes, or the genes line up on the chromosomes, the other way around. It happens random selection, so that no two of us are the same. We're all different. God has made us unique and made us different. And sometimes society sees Christians as all the same as well. And this is quite sad, because if their experience with a Christian is a positive one, then they have a positive concept of Christianity. But if their experience is a negative one, they have a negative view of Christianity and think us a lot of weirdos because they tend to see us as being uniform and we're all the same. We do that with Muslims, for example. So many of us categorize Muslims as all being evil people. They're not. There's many lovely Muslim people out there. But because of what's recently happened, we tend to categorize them all the same. People do that with us because they think of uniformity. You know, there, there's, there's a group of um, Christian people in our community right here who, who tried to put pressure on the opposition. You remember? Remember the time it happened in the election, the last election? They tried to put pressure on the opposition, you remember? And, and I was amazed when they came on the television screen, all those members of that particular religion, they all looked the same. Uniformity. God's not asking for uniformity. He's asking for unity. This passage in Galatians, chapter 3, verse 20, had a beautiful passage. It won't take time to turn it where it says that there is no longer Greek, there is no longer Jew, there's no longer male, no longer female. We're all one in Christ. If we use that in today's language, and that's a message that this world needs today more than ever before. And if it was used today, it would run like this. There is now no longer Polynesian, there is now no longer Maori, there is now no longer Pakeha, there is now no longer Asian or European or Yugoslavian. We're all Kiwis. That's what it's saying. It's not saying that there are no such thing as Polynesians and you can't maintain your culture. It's not saying that. It's not saying that we can't be Māori and keep our Māori culture. It's not saying that. It's not saying that I can't be Pākehā and keep my Pākehā culture. And by the way, we do have a culture. We don't think we do, but you go overseas and mix another culture, you soon realise we have our own culture too. There's nothing wrong with being Asian and having an Asian culture. There's nothing wrong with being Yugoslavian and having a Yugoslavian culture. Paul is not saying that. Paul is saying that we can be unique, we can be who we really are, but the unity is in Christ. Praise God, see? That's what he's saying. 
And it comes too with our way we see things in the Bible, in our theology. We don't have to all think the same. We don't want to be uniform. We're not, we're not members of the soldiers of the army. We're Christian community. And we want unity together, not uniformity. And that's what the Bible is teaching us here. You know, I think of what Ellen White said, a beautiful quote in, in Education, page 17 18. Every human being is created. The image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator. The power to think and to create. Wow, what a statement. Then she goes on, she says, we are to be thinkers, not reflectors of other people's thoughts. Wow, I love that, don't you? That's what our church needs, is people to be thinkers. And I'm going to make a statement here, and, and I'm going to say it very publicly because I believe it with my whole heart, that fundamentalism, and I don't care whether it's in the Muslim community, in the Christian community, or even in our own Adventist church, is dangerous. Do you know why it's dangerous? Because they want other people to think like they do. And we want to steer people, think for themselves, whereas that's totally against the Scripture. Paul, in his encounter with Christians around the world, he said he commended the Bereans, Acts chapter 17, the Brians, he said, stand out above everybody else. Do you know why? Because they studied for themselves. And friends, I'm going to share something. One of the dangers that is in our church at the moment is that we're spending so much time, there's nothing wrong with them, with tapes and ABN and some of the, the satellite programs that come down. They're good. But if that's our study of the Word of God, we miss the point. We're taking somebody else's food and not making it our own. The Brians, it says, they thought and they studied the word of God for themselves. They didn't accept what came down in the video. They didn't accept the tape. They studied the Bible for themselves. And that's lacking sometimes. I've been to many churches. I've been all over Australasia. I find it's the same problem. We're getting our food from the secondary source, not the primary source. God wants unity, not uniformity. The army demands his instant responses because it's obvious reasons. When you're in the heat of battle, you need an instant response. And that's why the army wants you to be uniform in everything you do. They use some interesting psychological mind manipulation methods to achieve this. One, in the morning, they drag you out of bed just as the sun was getting up and go out jogging. I didn't mind the jogging part of it, but the part that I hated was that when you jogged, you had to jog in formation. And not only did you jog in formation, but you had to jog in time. Left, right, left, right, as you jogged up the road. There were some lovely rewards. I remember jogging up the desert road in the early morning, the rising sun in the east, shining on Mount Ruapahi, the snow-covered mountain. There it was. What a beautiful sight. Absolutely majestic. I still have a very vivid picture of Ruapahi from those days of jogging up the desert road. Beautiful. There were some rewards. They also could put you on charge for the slightest provocation. When I went down to Burnham, because I was in the medical corps, they gave me or gave us all a special hat badge, you know, the medical one with the, the, the snake on the pole. And I don't know why, but my luck ran out. I was the only one that had a brass one. Everyone else had an anodized one. And in the army, brass is sacred. It's got to be polished every day. And in fact, when they cast my brass badge, they put in special chemicals so it would tarnish quicker. I'd have to polish it more often. And I remember uh, I was late for parade one morning and I hopped on the parade ground without polishing my badge and I was standing there at attention, you know, all dressed in my uniform and this big commanding officer stood in front of me and stood to attention. He looked at me and he said, put this man on charge. And without even thinking, I blurted out, Why? And he turned to me and he said, soldier, look me right in the eye and he said, and put his finger out, he said, soldier, you're in the army now, you don't ask why. And the next morning, two lance corporals with their double stripes on their sides came to my cabin and marched me over to the headquarters office. And I was between them, you know, left, right, left, right, in the building, turn, 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 turn. And the commanding officer sat there and he begins to read out from his book and he said, Private Weber, 304058, and so on, so on, so on, that's your number. You are hereby charged with a serious offence. And I said, what is coming? What have I done? It sounded so serious. He said, for being on parade ground with a dirty hat badge. Oh, I, I nearly burst out laughing. So, and my, my punishment was I had to run around the parade ground yelling out, I must clean my hat badge. Oh, no, I must clean my army badge. That's how, that's how it rhymed. You had to yell it out. I remember I was going around, the officer was going with me. Louder, soldier, louder. 
there and ringing, I must clean my hat badge, I must clean my army badge. But my heart was yelling out, army life is not for me. <laughs> I didn't want that. Slightest provocation, you're on charge. I remember when I was, because of another charge I'd had, I had to mow the lawns with a push mower. You know, not a motorised, it was a push mower. And I was mowing outside the barracks headquarters. And of course the officers keep coming and going and in the army you have to salute officers. Anybody that has their insignia on the top of their shoulder, you've got to salute them. On the side it doesn't matter. You know the sergeant has it on the side but they have it on the top, crown and so on. You must salute them. And uh, I remember um, mowing the lawn and I, I missed saluting one. Because you'd be mowing and you have to stop and then you'd salute. And you start mowing again and you stop and you salute. And this, this would go on and on. And I turned my back on one so I didn't have to do it. And he called me out and he said, come here, son. And in front of all the big parade people down standing out the side, he said, now show me how to salute. And I was so embarrassed. In front of all these people I had to stand up, you know, and there's the longest way up and the shortest way down. I had to do this several times till I got it perfect. The army wants total obedience. Total obedience. But I won a trophy. I won the day. I got my own bag. I remember they had this beautiful big shell. It was a huge, big shell. It was about this high. So round. The only problem was it was made of brass. I had to polish that as well. But it sat by my bed for weeks. And every time anybody would come in, they would look at the shell, you know, a, 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 an officer, and say, is that your soldier? He would say, congratulations, soldier. Well done. And I was really proud of that. My... my my mana in that army went up a thousandfold because of that medal that I'd won, that big shell. I was so proud of that shell. It just made all the difference to my life in the army. And you're asking me, what was it for? Was it for because you'd run something or you'd, you'd gone over the obstacle course the fastest or you'd done some great feat in the army? What was it for? Why did you win that big shell? I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, but it was true. It was because I made my bed the best of any other soldier in the camp. That's why I won the top. So there you are. It made a difference to my life. The, the, whole reason, the whole reason for the army life and for being in the army and all the training and so on is um, that was my prize trophy. But the whole reason for being in the army was to prepare for battle, to, to prepare for war. If any of you are familiar with West Australia, a lot of these shots come from West Australia. A soldier must keep a level head and prepare for battle. I, I remember reading of the, uh, the insignia code. You remember that um, code that the Germans had and they were able to tell where the submarines were and uh, they could send out in code. And uh, they, the, the uh, Allies found it difficult to copy the code because they kept changing all the time. You know, they'd type in a Y but on the submarine it would come out as a B and it would be all mixed up. And it was, a, it was a great mystery and they knew they had to capture one. They actually got one on a boat and sunk a submarine with a code on it. In the process of getting away from this, because they didn't want the Germans to know that they actually had it. In the process of getting away, the, the submarine that the Allies were on was damaged and they couldn't dive. And they could see a, um, a, a German battleship coming. And they knew they had to get under quickly. One of the hoses was leaking in, had to turn a valve off in a very tight compartment, and it was under water. And the officer ordered the young fellow, the youngest guy on that submarine, just a young, young lad, ordered him to go in and turn the valve off. And without questioning, the young fellow swam in, and he swam to his death. He knew he could never get back. The officer knew he would never get back. But he saved the sub. Say the Enigma Code. That's why, why the army requires total obedience. So we have instant action and we don't question when it comes to the battle. Sometimes they make wrong decisions. I remember when I was up in Papua New Guinea, we were up at Papandeta, which was called Buna, before the war. And it was where the, the, uh, the Allies came across from Port Moresby, across the Owen Stanley Ranges. And you've heard of the Kokoda Trail, the Fuzzy Wuzzy Tails? It's that area there. We're right in there. And the 
little museum they had, they were showing it, some of the tragedies that the Allies faced in going from Port Moresby across the Owen Stanley Ranges to Popendetta. They didn't die of bullet wounds or, or fighting. They died of malaria and diarrhoea. They write there how it was so bad that they had to cut the back out of their trousers. And, and if you've ever been in an area like that and suffered the agony of those diseases that they have, you can understand what they went through. And when they got there, they found the Japanese were in the same situation. Bodies were piled up. They gave a command back to Brisbane where the, their commanding officer was, General MacArthur, was in an air-conditioned office in Brisbane. And they gave him the command back that it's too tough, we can't get through. And his reply was, go forward, we know no defeat. He'd never seen the territory. He made a terrible mistake. Thousands of lives were lost because of his decision on that particular occasion. But the good news is that Jesus, our general, never makes a mistake. He doesn't make mistakes. He didn't sit in an air-conditioned office back in the courts of glory, way out there in space, and issue instructions on what we should do. He actually came down here and became one of us and fought the battle for us. He fought and defeated the forces of evil. And the good news is that his victory is our victory. He restored the broken relationship with God. He remembered that. And that's really the definition of sin, is a broken relationship with God. He mended that and restored us back to God's image. What a wonderful general we have. He never makes mistakes. How does that suit us practically? I mean, that's all very nice in theory. But what does it mean practically? I want to tell you, friends, what it means practically is this. That I think of Bruce Hort, my mate over in Perth, who struggled those years that we were there with cancer and finally got him. Left behind four beautiful little kids. And the hours I sat with him, where well, he's undergoing chemo chemotherapy. And so and I remember telling him the story when he got so discouraged, he got down and he found he couldn't cope. He said, I'd rather give up. I remember telling him, Bruce, the battle's over. The victory is yours for the taking. Because of what our general has done. The practical application of this is for a frazzled mother who feels she can't cope. She's got all the kids and she's just about to cop out with life. I tell those mothers, mothers, the battle is over. The victory is yours for the taking. That's what they're saying to us. Those who are aging like myself, I suddenly come to the realisation I'm 60 years of old and a little bit more. I think, wow, where have the years gone? I woke up the other night in the sweat. Samuel, the battle's over. The victory's won. It's yours for the taking. I want to say to the alcoholic that's caught in the vice grip of alcohol and can't seem to, is powerless to break out of it. And we've got them in our churches too, tell, to tell you. I want to say to people caught in that, the battle is won, the victory is yours for the taking. I want to say to that, that guy up there in Kaikoui who abused me because I interrupted him when I went to fix his stove and he was doing pee on the stove, caught in the grip of drugs and so abusive and so caustic with his language. I want to put them around and say, brother, the battle's over. The victory's yours for the taking. Those with financial worries and financial pressures in life and feel they can't cope, claim the promise the battle is over. The victory's yours. Those in broken relationships and are struggling in, in relationships that are breaking up, the battle's over. The victory's won. It's yours for the taking. I don't want to minimise the struggles. We all have struggles. I don't want to minimise people's struggles and not all because our struggles are very real. But with this understanding of what we're talking about here, Jesus, our general, he makes no mistakes. He takes us through to victory. It empowers us in the midst of our vices. I don't care who we are. We can be Adventists for 10, 20, 30 years. We still have little vices. And it can empower us in those vices and give us victory. I want to tell you those who are facing death, it can be a comfort when we are facing the monster of death. It can be peace from our guilt. It gives us self-worth in the midst of depression. It gives us forgiveness in the place of hurts and anger. Anger is the result of hurts. We get angry because we hurt. We 
gives us acceptance in the midst of our rejection, hope in the midst of despair, security when we feel insecure, and rest for our restlessness. That's the practical application of what we're sharing with you this morning. You know, years after the war was over, the first, Second World War was over, when I was up there in Papua New Guinea, they, the nationals were telling us how there were many Japanese running around the bush for years later, years and years later, thinking the battle was still raging. They didn't know that the victory had been won. Living a life of hell. You know what, sometimes, friends, we live our Christian life like that. We forget sometimes that the battle is won. The victory is gained. It's there for our taking. Wonderful promise that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you, Lewis. I want to finish with this thought.